preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I should like to make uh, two remarks which have nothing to do with the lecture, or maybe the one has something to do with it, the first one. And that is, uh, I want to make it very clear that the picket line outside is an inform what is called an informative picket line and not a strike picket line. Had it been a strike picket line, I would not be here, and I assume many of you would not be here either. Uh, if you permit me one personal remark, I got a number of letters from members of the audience, which takes me a little time to answer. I have answered most of them, but the, uh, it will still take a few days. So please do not think that I neglected them. Uh, now, we were in the middle, or rather at the end last time, of uh, discussing what I call the necrophilus orientation. I spoke about this orientation as an intense or profound attraction to death, to decay, to the inorganic, to the controllable, to the mechanical, as against the biophilic orientation, which, is, which expresses an attraction to life, to growth, to organic processes, I spoke in connection with this of the wish to rule and dominate, and maybe very little of the wish to obey. And uh, nevertheless, I might have, if I had the time, talked about it. And I should like to use this occasion to share with you uh, a statement which a friend of mine, James Newman, the uh, gave me today of a mathematician, uh, of a great mathematician, William Kingdon Clifford which he wrote in 1875. And the statement is, if there is one thing in the world more wicked than the desire to command, it is a, it is a willingness to obey. Uh, I think this sentence is uh, so fundamental and so important that uh, it should be included in any discussion about human behavior in which self-affirmation and human will is replaced by some kind of a symbiotic relationship. I was talking about the fact that uh, the difference of the view I presented here and that of Freud was that I'm not speaking about two biological principles inherent in all life which fight with each other, but I was speaking about the primary principle of living matter namely the tendency to be alive and to be attracted to life and the pathology. When something has gone wrong and this tendency to be alive has been transformed or perverted, if you want, into the pathological tendency to be attracted by death and decay. Now I should like to make here a remark which is uh, uh, very difficult to formulate and uh, yet I think I should, for the better understanding, say something about it. I spoke here last time, and I mention it right now again, I used the concept attraction. Now, when I speak of attraction here, I really mean it in the sense of physics, rather than in the sense of speaking of an attractive girl. By that I mean that there is energy involved in the person's relationship to a certain goal, or uh, energy involved in which a person, for instance, in this case, relates himself to death and decay. Now, let me state that it was a great discovery of Freud. Perhaps not that he discovered it for the first time, because novelists and dramatists had discovered it before but certainly, in general, psychologists had not discovered it or at least not seen it clearly. That one can understand human behavior, human attitudes, only if one sees that here energy is at work and not just a learned pattern. 
that people are relatively unchangeable, that people go on in the way they have started to go on, uh, because their particular orientation is charged with energy. It is not just something like you learn a foreign language or like you learn a foreign behavior. That's easy enough. But if deep down your energy is channeled in the direction to be attracted to death or, on the other hand, to be attracted to life, or if your energy is channeled in the direction of wanting to receive, to wanting to remain the eternal suckling at the breast of your mother, whatever forms this take, or whether your energy is channeled in, I will, shall be speaking about this today, in terms of narcissism, and what that is I shall try to explain later. You deal with attitudes which are charged with energy. Now, Freud saw this, <clears throat> and Freud used a concept which was quite natural for his time. Namely, he picked out the one obvious thing in which psychic behavior is, uh, let us say, obviously charged with energy, and that was sexual behavior or sexual desire. There, anybody could see that sexual desire uh, is not just something which uh, is like uh, uh, the pleasure of, uh, let us say, for many people to go to the Metropolitan Museum or to come to this lecture or anything else, something relatively undynamic, but that sexual desire has in, is in itself charged with great energy. So Freud used the the frame of reference of libido, of sexual instinct, in order to express his discovery that all psychic acts or all psychic strivings are by their nature sexual. That was mo the most convenient and, as it seemed then, the most logical way of expressing the energetic, dynamic character of human behavior. Today, it seems that for many reasons, this concept is somewhat dated because clinical experience has shown that sexual desire is not that central as at the end of the Victorian age or even the beginning of the century, Freud and many people believed. Besides that, the whole development of modern physics has shown that uh, what we can talk of energies and forces without necessarily to have to re uh, take recourse to sexual energy. Now, uh, Jung tried to evade the difficulty by calling libido uh, en psychic energy in general without ever uh, really uh, going further than that in this one particular point. I cannot offer a certain, I cannot offer a concept or a word rather which would uh, replace the word libido. I would prefer to speak of psychic energy, but I, uh, in a, rather than offering you a word, I would like to offer you um, a concept, uh, even though this concept is not sufficiently well phrased. And that is the concept that what we observe is that any human personality is a particular, constitutes a particular structure charged with intense energy. And one might say, we would simply disintegrate if we were not held together by high charges of energy in the particular way in which our, really, in which our uh, drives or impulses or tendencies are directed. Now, just as uh, the energy, which is matter, is seen as matter and not as energy, where nothing happens, so the personality seems, if I may use this uh, analogy from physics, seems like matter, seems like this table, where nothing happens. Everything seems to be static. But when something does happen, as, for instance, in the case of neurosis or mental illness, then we see that energies are at work 
which are even much stronger than that which seems to be the most fundamental biological drive, the wish to live, which in fact are much stronger than the sexual drive. The energy invested in, let us say, the attraction to death is certainly stronger and more intense than the energy invested in the wish to live or in sex. The sexual drive in these people sometimes mitigates the intensity of this drive to destroy by uh, smuggling itself into the drive to destroy, blending itself with it, and therefore making it somewhat less risky and dangerous. Uh, it is also true that to change the basic distribution of energy in the nuclear structure of a person is almost as difficult as splitting an atom. That is to say, uh, it is easy to teach somebody to think differently, to behave differently, to adopt different patterns, but if you want a basic change, and that is always a change in the distribution of energy in the nuclear pattern of a per structure of a person, let us say, from a high degree of destructiveness to shifting it to less necrophilia and more biophilia, or from a high degree of narcissism, shifting it to more capacity to being related to the world, this cannot be done simply by teaching him how to do it. This requires some change in, as I said before, distribution of energy within the structure of the personality and how this is possible to happen is the, red, is the secret of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. I think of one thing and that is there is something similar to what happened in the physical world. This does not happen without another strong energy uh, being involved or uh, or meeting that existing mass, that existing energy structure. Now, what happens between human beings in general and between the therapist and the patient specifically is very often that something happens which is not theory and not expli uh, 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 explication and not history taking only, but which is that which happens between two people if they are uh, alive, namely that something of, let us say, the wish for life in one person touches the other person and has an impact on his energy distribution. Uh, this is only a lever. This is not, uh, I'm not saying here in any way that just like that and the person will, something will change, although this can happen. It can happen even without the benefit of any psychiatric or religious help, but it happens, unfortunately, very rarely. Now, uh, I don't know whether I conveyed to you the minimum of what I wanted to convey here, that in speaking of these tendencies, like necrophilia, or what I shall talk about today, narcissism, I speak of them in terms of energy-charged tendencies, not so different from Freud, except that I leave the, what seems to be narrow framework of Freud's libido theory and use a framework which has not, nothing directly to do with sexual energy, but which is indeed has to do with energy and the way how energy reacts to influences and the inertia which it, it gives unless there are influences. Uh, unless one understands the energy, the intensity of the energy charged involved in all this, one cannot understand why people rush to their death, why people prefer to destroy rather than to save, why people prefer unhappiness to happiness. This is what we call irrational behavior, all right. But this irrational behavior and the difficulty of changing it in any person or in any group rest exactly on the fact that this irrationality is not an error of thought. This irrationality is a misgrowth, if you want, if I may use that word, is a faulty growth, is a faulty channeling of energy. 
And that is what really constitutes human pathology, in mental pathology. As in some cases, that is also what constitutes physiological pathology. Well, I uh, should like perhaps just to add one sentence, although I don't know whether that's particularly helpful. Uh, and that is just the concept that man who is not determined as the, animal, as the animal is, strongly by instinctual drives, by a built-in direction to his actions, namely instincts, that man is held together by the energy which is charged in his particular character structure and also his relationship to the world outside is established and made firm by the energy which relates, which is involved in the particular relatedness he has to the world outside. Well, I don't know whether I have been helpful with all this or not. I try to. I just wanted to make clear that the difference between the premises I have here and Freud's premises are only that I, I do not use the libido and sex concept as a frame of reference for what Freud discovered, namely this energetic dynamic quality of human attitudes. But uh, I rest upon the basic discovery of Freud, namely of this dynamic and energetic, energetic character of all that is truly motivating a person. Now, maybe I should add one more thing, and that is, Consciously, we are often not aware of what truly motivates us. We may be attracted to death and decay and think we are attracted to life. We may wish to eat somebody up and consciously think we love him. We may wish to dominate somebody and we may consciously think that we mean only the best for him. Usually, all these regressive tendencies, archaic tendencies, are not conscious to us in our culture. In a group of cannibals, in a cannibalistic culture, uh, there is no need to repress the wish to eat somebody up because one hopes that in eating them up it will increase one's own strength. No repression needed there. Maybe repression needed there against the revulsion to do this. We need repression for our cannibalism and if I might remind you, we all are cannibals, uh, more or less so. Uh, but if I may remind you again of uh, Hitler, I think I mentioned last time the picture when, yes, I, I did, of the, of the uh, uh, conclusion of the uh, Armistice Treaty with France when he had this, did this dance. There was a cannibal who had just swallowed a country. Now, he was not aware that he was a cannibal because we don't think in these terms. But there he was. And you observe yourself and you will see the cannibal in us. Some more, some less. But this was really the great discovery of Freud, that the forces with which we are dealing here are not the motivations we believe we have, but they are motivations which usually are not conscious to us and which we try to rationalize in different ways. All right, now, um, let me just conclude the discussion of um, necrophilia by making a few remarks of the connection between the problem of necrophilia and our society today, Western society, in the year 1963. We are a society which tends to automatize, to mechanize, to appreciate the inorganic, the controllable, as against life and the uncontrollable. I read to you last time the, uh, mani the Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti, where you see together these elements. You see the love for death and destruction, the love for gadgets and engines, the hate against women, and that means, if I may make a footnote, the hate against life. I think one might say that for each sex, 
the other sex represents life and that the fear of life is expressed in the fear or hate of the other sex. Just as a polarity between the two sexes creates life, each sex to the other is life. And, the one, and it is not surprising that this man, Marinetti, and many others who hated life and loved death also hated women. <coughs> 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 And I'm afraid then one cannot, I, at least I cannot avoid saying a word about the situation we are confronted with, and that is the danger of nuclear destruction. Uh, I have often asked myself, as many people have asked themselves, how is it possible? How is it possible? I have asked myself since I was a boy at 14, when the First World War break, broke out, or I'm, to be uh, more correct, when I was 14, I didn't ask myself yet. But when this slaughter went on, year after year, and I was 16 and 17, I asked myself, how is it possible that men stay in the trenches worse than animals and are slaughtered for the whims and for the stupidity of generals? And there are a few books which have been published right now which show that in all details, although it was no secret before. And naturally, more people ask themselves, and I ask myself, how is it possible today that the Western world, and I think Russia is also part of the Western world, historically speaking, is preparing, and soon the Eastern world, and by that I mean the Chinese, are preparing weapons which can only lead to a destruction of unimaginable horror. Why do people do it? Why are people ready to let things go on. And really, one answer, which I uh, feel is not the answer, but one answer is, not that people are so destructive, but that people do not li love life enough. That we are not precisely in a culture where people hate life, in a necrophilous culture. But we are living in a culture where life is not anymore so terribly attractive. Unconsciously. Consciously, everybody wants fun and excitement. But underneath that, I think there is a great deal of depression and boredom. And a feeling that after all, why is it so important to go on living? a feeling in which life is not the most precious opportunity which every human being has and of which he wants to make use. And I think this lack, increasing lack of love of life is one of the factors which bring us in this situation. And one reason why I gave this lecture on necrophilia is simply is that I feel it is important to be aware rather than to be unaware of the necrophilous tendencies in each one of us, of the necrophilous tendencies in some people who love death and rationalize their death by all sorts of things, of uh, uh, rationalizations, which I do not want to, uh, to go into now, and that we know there is a pathology which loves death and destruction and which usually expresses itself in terms of all sorts of virtues and that we should be very aware of it and suspicious of it and think of the fact that there is such a thing as necrophilia and that this is more dangerous for mankind than the pest. Now, uh, I want to talk today about the third concept which I think is at the root of a great deal of hostility, and that is the concept of narcissism. Uh, well, the concept of narcissism is a concept Freud created. He took it from the Greek myth of Narcissus, a beautiful youth with whom uh, the nymph Echo fell in love, but he rejected her. And as a punishment, he looked into a lake, saw the mirror of his face in the lake, saw, saw his face in the mirror of the lake, 
and was so preoccupied with his own face that he fell into the lake and was drowned. Freud used this concept in order to indicate there is a kind of personality who is in love with himself. Now, what does this mean? Let me perhaps describe first some of the basic findings of Freud. The, more, the simplest one is, uh, and Freud pointed out to that, the newborn infant, the infant in the first period of his life. For this infant, there is not yet a reality outside of him. In fact, he cannot even perceive the mother's nipple as being an object as against his mouth being the subject. Mother's nipple and his mouth and his body are just one. There is the harmony and union which exists before there is any kind of individuation. For this infant, there is only one reality, and that is the subjective sensations within himself. His hunger, his thirst, his coldness, his need for bodily touch and warmth. But the world outside is still not existing. Freud called this primary narcissism, and he was forced by his libido theory to conceive of narcissism as libido still within oneself and not yet sent out to the world. A frame of reference which actually, I'm afraid, uh, restricted a great deal the development of the concept of narcissism uh, in, Fro in Freud's own thinking, and I believe uh, in the thinking of later Freudians. The other case where Freud talked about narcissism is the psychotic person. Now, the psychotic person can be characterized and is characterized by Freud as a person for whom the world outside does not have reality either. Uh, the only reality is his own thought and feeling. And the world outside does not exist. Now, to speak again in terms of energy forms, of energy concepts, I would say what the highly narcissistic person experiences is that all energy is turned toward himself, whether that is a newborn child or the psychotic person. Uh, the world outside does not exist. It is not real. Let us say, if you take the paranoid person, to give an example, in contrast, let us say, to all of us who are more or less neurotic persons, uh, if I feel people don't like me, and even people hate me, well, I still know I feel that, that they don't, but I'm not quite sure. I am afraid of it, but I still know this is my fear. But if I am not anymore aware that this is a fear, but if I see that you people tonight have come here to kill me and to put some poison in this water before I came, if I have no doubt about it, then I am convinced, then my own fear has become a substitute for reality. Has become a substitute for reality. I'm not anymore afraid you dislike me. I am convinced I know you have put poison here. And how do I know, how can I ever prove that it's not true? Only by drinking the water and waiting. Uh, <laughs> now, there is one thing which I want to state, or maybe let me say this first. The extreme forms of narcissism in the infant and in the psychotic person are easy to recognize. But what is much more difficult to recognize is the normal narcissism of all of us, in us who are so-called normal persons. Let me give you a few examples for the normal narcissism. The first example is a little bit less normal, the others are a little bit more normal. Uh, let us assume, as I have experienced it many times, and I'm sure any other psychiatrist who makes appointments has experienced it, 
Somebody calls up and says, Doctor, I want to have an appointment with you. And I say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not free this week, but next week. But doctor, I live only five minutes from your office. And I say, yes, that's fine, but this does not change the fact that I have no time this week. But doctor, can't you see? It's only, it means nothing to me. It's only five minutes. This goes on maybe for two or three minutes, depending on the patient's of the doctor and the insistence of the patient, but a very important diagnostic statement has already been made by the doctor, and that is that this patient is severely sick. <laughs> no, there's nothing funny about it because what the patient or what this woman shows is that she is not capable of distinguishing in her own thought between her and myself. Because it's easy for her, it's easy for me. And it is not possible for her to understand that her requirements are, could be different from my requirements. Now you find very often the same situation where somebody would say this and I would give the same answer and then the person would say, oh I see, yes, you are quite right. Now here the diagnosis would be different because obviously here you have a person who is capable of seeing it, although there is a good deal of narcissism which even uh, brings forward the first argument, which is, which is ludicrous in itself, logically speaking. Well, that is an example for narcissism. A slight, uh, that's already one of the more extreme forms, where the person is not capable of distinguishing between himself and the other person. Now let us take a less pathological and more frequent narcissism, which is contained in the well-known joke of a writer talking to a friend. He talks, the writer talks about himself for 15 minutes, and then he says, now let's, we have talked so much about myself, let's talk about you. And the friend says, fine, and the writer says, how did you like my latest book? <laughs> uh, here you find a much more frequent form of narcissism, and that is the preoccupation with self, or with ego, and the lack of interest in what goes on in the other person. Or let me give you an example, which I heard recently, just a few days ago in fact, of a conversation between one of the most intelligent men in this country and an acquaintance. And this acquaintance who came from abroad said to him, they talked about politics, I have to say this intelligent man happens to be a Jew uh, and a refugee, and this uh, acquaintance said um, to him, um, well, after all, America is not so pure either. Take, for instance, the race problem he ha you have. And the intelligent said, man said, race problem? Why do you talk about anti-Semitism? We have no anti-Semitism here. And it was very difficult to understand for him that when the other man talked about the race problem in America, he talked about Negroes. In fact, the intelligent man said then, when eventually it was cleared up that he was talking about Negroes, he then said, Negroes, indeed they are inferior, and I wouldn't want to have my daughter go into school where, are, where there are Negroes. He didn't even talk about marriage. Uh, well, now this is, a tip, uh, again, a typical narcissistic and rather severe, uh, rather pathological narcissistic reaction that when it is so obvious that if one speaks about the race problem in America, one speaks about the Negro problem, that for him being a Jew, all that he hears is his problem, and not the problem of America. Well, now, of course, one could give examples of this kind by the hundreds, but it's hardly necessary because I'm sure if you watch yourself and watch others, you will have one example every day without the need to listen to me. <coughs> but if we come to the more normal forms of narcissism, then you find a phenomenon which we are all familiar with, and that is a certain amount of over-evaluation of our own ideas, ideas, pains, feelings, joys, activities, is against the interest we have in the ideas, feelings, and joys of other people. Now, that doesn't, I'm speaking here of over-evaluation, simply inf implying that we are not at least equally interested, but we are a little bit more interested in what we feel, we suffer, 
And then you have the people who can talk by the hour of their operations, of their sicknesses. Although that could be necrophilus, it's not necessarily so, because unfortunately, in our culture, in spite of everything, for many people, their sicknesses are the most interesting events in their lives. <laughs> this is a sad comment, but it's a fact for many, and therefore the narcissistic person who wants to talk about himself, what is he to talk about? He talks about his illnesses, and the other person then offers in exchange his sicknesses. They are not really interested in the other person's sickness, but they offer each other the chance to talk about it, and so they are willing to listen for a while. Uh, you see the narcissistic element in the normal form, let us say, in the sensitivity to criticism, uh, in touchiness to criticism, uh, which you find is always greater in the more narcissistic person. He may, however, and this is a special case, be so narcissistic, that he has an image of himself that he is not touching. So you can tell him everything. He will just have a Christian smile, I mean a smile of Christian uh, charity, and prove to you that you cannot ruffle him. He gets never angry. But he may get an ulcer or something by repressing <laughs> his anger for so long. Now, I should like to say the normal and neurotic narcissism in all of us implies some implies one thing, that we are not fully open to the world, that we are more or less filled with our own ego, and therefore that there is something like a veil between ourselves and the world, and it is simply a matter of degree how thick that veil is, how immovable it is, how often it is torn or raised, whatever analogy you want to use. And at that point, we are fully engaged and interested in the world. I should like to say one thing here in order not to be misunderstood, although it's a highly complicated problem. I said here of the psychotic person that he represents the extreme form of narcissism. But then you find many psychotic persons who have a sensitivity and insight into the other person, into another person, which is far beyond that of the normal person. And this seems completely to contradict what I was saying before, and I don't have the time to explain it much, but I should like to say one thing. It seems that when you have broken off your relationships to the world in a practical sense, when you are really not interested anymore because you don't want anything anymore, that then you are sometimes capable of an insight which is greater than the normal person has who is more related to the world. In other words, you might say the extremist form of narcissism is in some way less inhuman, less close to the world than the normal form of narcissism in which my whole relationship to the world because it is not interrupted, because it's not severed, is one in which I want to get all the things from the world which feed my narcissism. I'm sorry that me, what I said right now will probably remain uh, kind of mysterious to most of you, but I had to say it simply because it would be a distortion of the facts not to point out to this peculiar quality which you will find in many psychotic persons and Anyone who talks to them sometimes, any normal person envies them for the sensitivity of their judgment, of their response. Now, <clears throat> let me say one word about uh, narcissism as a phenomenon in general. You might say narcissism is a biological necessity from the standpoint of survival. If man did not have a special interest in his own survival, which is stronger than the interest in his fellow man, survival of the individual and of groups would probably be threatened. So therefore, it is, uh, if I could use this uh, figure of speech, this teleological figure of speech, it would be to be expected that nature used the trick of endowers with narcissism for the purpose of biological survival. 
But it is also true that if narcissism transcended a certain threshold, it would work against survival because it would make impossible that minimum of social cooperation on which even the individual life rests. Therefore, on biological grounds, we would expect that there is an optimum of narcissism, an optimum, which is not the maximum, which keeps the individual and even a group uh, more interest in their survival than in the survival of others, and yet which is below that threshold in which social cohesion is threatened. That there is another aspect, namely that of spiritual survival and affirmation, which does not require narcissism, is something I shall mention in a few minutes. Now, let me say something about this, the pathology of narcissism. One pathological effect of narcissism is quite clear, and that is that it creates faulty judgment and uh, a lack of appreciation of reality. Uh, the narcissistic person, being mainly concerned with himself and not with the world outside, will make severe mistakes because it doesn't see the reality outside. Again, I want to mention Hitler as an example. He was, aside from being a necro necrophilist person, a very narcissistic person. And if you study his history, then you will find that he made some of the most severe blunders. I'll only mention three. That he did not push the invasion of England, that he did not push the development of uh, atomic energy, and that he made this big mistake in his attack against Russia. All these big mistakes he made were mistakes of lack of judgment, because this man was filled only with his ego, and he was not capable of seeing reality fully. He was not a dumb man, he was a very clever man. But this characterological lack of his narcissism made it impossible for him to see the facts, to appreciate the strength of the United States, for instance, to appreciate the importance for him of spending more money of, on the development of atomic energy, to appreciate the fact of the Russian winter. This narcissistic madman felt he was stronger than the winter. He was stronger than anything. And so his judgment, his simple rational judgment, was lacking and faulty. That is one pathological result of narcissism directly. <clears throat> but I want to add something to this, and that is a pathological result if a person's narcissism is wounded. You have usually two results. So I have the picture of myself secretly and if God knows for what reason, even I don't, I don't know, maybe if I'm a film star or God knows what, or uh, uh, high up in the government or something, even not secretly, that I'm really wonderful. I cannot make, I do not make any mistakes. I'm just wonderful. This is my image. Now, as long as I can act in such a way that the reality supports me in this, that is to say, Millions of people think that this film star, man or woman, is just wonderful, and a silly picture is wonderful, and they spend millions of dollars for this. Then the narcissism cannot be recognized because it seems like real. The reality, the narcissistic fiction, is confirmed by consensus or by reality. This is a true folly a million, where if nobody, if, if some one of us got up here and said, don't you want to spend millions to see me? Well, everybody would laugh. But if there is a way to produce a lot of nonsense and yet having millions of people say, this woman who has a love affair with every third actor she meets <laughs> and uh, whose films uh, pay, uh, uh, bring millions of dollars, then suddenly the narcissism is confirmed by what seems reality when in, in fact those who admire this person are equally narcissistic because they, reflect, they live from reflected glory. And that's what, what they, why they call themselves, they are fans. They are fans of that idol 
And so the higher they make the idol, the more is reflected on themselves. But when this feeling of uh, whatever it is, the feeling which some people have, if you see highly narcissistic people, they come into a room and say, good morning. And uh, they think they have said something just wonderful. <laughs> now, if you are a boss in a big enterprise and a head of a corporation or something, and you say good morning in that way, then all your underlings will react as if you had said something wonderful. <laughs> if you are just an ordinary person, uh, people will say, so what the hell? Uh, now, if for one reason or other this narcissistic conviction is wounded by a mistake I make, by, being, by losing power, for instance, uh, some of you will remember the pictures of the Nazi leaders at the dock in the Nuremberg trial and compared with how they looked when they had power. They looked like poor schnooks and that is... Uh, <laughs> A mild expression, utterly frightened, impoverished, uninteresting little men who were not even interesting to look at. And compare the same men when they had power. What you see is precisely in this difference. The narcissistic inflation of a dumb, ordinary man who succeeds in inflating himself by his own feeling that he is somebody great. Now, when this happens, then you have two results. Either one result is depression. Depression, I would venture to say, as a very hypothetical remark, seems to me, if not always in many cases, the result of the wounding of the narcissistic image. I have felt inflated, and at one point, I see that this is not so. I cannot persuade anybody anymore to share it with me. Not even one person, perhaps. And this thing collapses. And then I feel utterly empty. Because I have been the image, my narcissistic image. And Freud had spoken uh, of depression in terms of mourning, of a mourning process, of somebody who has been interjected and so on. I really think what we find in depression is Mourning for the disappearance of one's own narcissistic image. If that falls, the person is left with utter emptiness. And that's why people hang on so much to the narcissistic image and to those things which help it make it real. What seems very often as a wish for power is actually the fright to lose that narcissistic image which would be lost once I lose my power. And therefore, people fight for it as they fight for life or more so. Because if they lose the power, they lose their narcissistic image. And if they lose that, they are nobody. And they, are, they fall into depressions. The other possibility of reaction to the wounding of the narcissism is rage. You observe that in yourself, you observe in somebody else. If the narcissistic person, depending on how narcissistic he is, is hurt in his narcissism, then he will be get furious, consciously or unconsciously, because this is a threat to himself. This attack to his narcissism, which is the fact that he's criticized, is a threat to his whole personality, which is identified with this narcissistic picture. And here you have indeed the, prob the picture of narcissism as one of the great sources of hostility and destructiveness. Uh, namely, highly narcissistic persons, when their narcissism is, is attacked, develop an, can develop hostility unless they develop a depression, which is of utmost intensity and probably as strong as the hostility which is rooted in necrophilia. Uh, <clears throat> Let me incidentally make one remark. Uh, one of the early uh, pure students of Freud, Abraham, Carl Abraham, made a very interesting distinction in narcissism, uh, namely the distinction between positive and negative narcissism. What he means by that is you take, uh, let us say, a woman who spends many, many hours concerned with her own body and uh, her beauty and so on, and 
another woman who spends just as many hours concerned with possible illnesses she has, something one calls hypochondriasis. And the man is just the same. I mean, he just uh, combs his hair 20 times uh, or, 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 or practices uh, his uh, God knows what ex facial expression in front of the mirror, how he wants to talk to his boss or to, his, uh, 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 to the people under him. Actually, the positive narcissism, for instance, va what we call vanity and hypochondriasis, are not basically different. They are the same concern with oneself. Only one time you have it thinking you are the most impressive and wonderful man, and the other time you think you are the sickest man. But in both instances, you think of yourself all the time. Because as soon as you become really involved and engaged and interested in the world, you just don't think so much about your sickness, nor about how wonderful you are. Now, uh, uh, I uh, need now, I'm sorry, I'm a little really behind my schedule, but perhaps you won't mind if I talk a little bit, uh, go a little bit over, well, it isn't even the hour yet, uh, my time, because I have to mention one uh, concept which I think is very important for understanding narcissism. And that is the transformation of personal narcissism into group narcissism. What is meant here, and Freud already started with this concept by pointing out how often love to one's husband, one's children, is actually of a narcissistic nature. In fact, Freud was very extreme, and I think not right, in assuming that love is always of a narcissistic nature that one falls only in love because one has chosen, let us say if one is a man, a woman to be the one, and then because I have chosen her, I endow her with all the narcissistic qualities which I have, just as people love their cars and their houses. And even if they are all split level, it's still their house and they think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Uh, but the, uh, real, uh, the real importance does not lie so much in the fact of the uh, uh, transference, let us say, of personal narcissism into one's family. But I think the most important, at least today, result of it is that narcissism is transferred from the personal to religion, nation, and political ideology or political party. Uh, what you find today, what you found, let us say, in the uh, 16th and, uh, well, especially in the 16th and 17th century was a tremendous narcissism invested in one's religion. Catholics and Protestants accused each other of being devils, of poisoning wells, of God knows what, all because of differences in theology which to most people who are not particularly familiar with this theology would hardly even be recognized when they read the statement of both sides. Where came this fanaticism from, psychologically speaking? Because they had transferred their own personal narcissism to their religion. Being members of this religion endowed the religion with the same qualities with which the personal narcissism is endowed. Now you see the same thing today about race behind the attitude of the whites in the South, and I don't mean of all whites, but of those who are so fanatical about uh, uh, their, the inferiority of Negroes and so on, is their narcissism. And you find an interesting phenomenon. The less, a man ha the less reason a man has to be proud of himself, materially, intellectually, or morally, the more narcissistic he is, and the more he will choose his race as the most wonderful race in the world. That is a phenomenon to be seen in the South in the United States. It's a phenomenon to be seen, which could be seen in Germany under Hitler, because the bearers of the racial narcissism of Hitler was not the working class, and it was not the middle class, and it was not the upper class. It was the lower middle class, which indeed had lost almost everything in the historical process, which made them feel proud in any realistic sense. So if you have nothing to be proud of, you are proud to be white or to be an Aryan 
uh, well, we know that nationalism has played a great role, that in fact, since uh, 200 years, the fanaticism of religion has been changed to fanaticism of nationality. My nation is the most wonderful nation. And today, I think we see the picture that it's, that it's not so much anymore nationalism and race, but political ideology or certain political concepts, which become the foci of narcissism. Now, it is quite clear that this transference from personal narcissism to group narcissism has great advantages. If I stand up here and say, ladies and gentlemen, I am the most wonderful man in the world. My mother, my father, my family were superior to all other families. I'm pretty sure where you would send me. If I say, however, ladies and gentlemen, my nation, my race, my political party is the most wonderful in the world. Every other nation and race and so on is inferior. Then, I hope not this audience, but many people will say, I am a very good man because I love my nation, my race, my religion, when actually I do nothing but making an extreme narcissistic statement. The group narcissism has a terrific advantage that it's shared, and I mean terrific, terrifying advantage, that it's shared by millions and therefore it loses pathological character. The madness of group narcissism is as great as the madness of individual narcissism, but the madness is invisible because of the consensus within the group. And then when group narcissism is hurt, then indeed people act as madly as in highly narcissistic individuals act when their private, personal narcissism is hurt. And then we get hostilities and aggression and destructiveness which can be fostered by all kinds of things but which nevertheless have their root in the fact that that narcissistic energy which has been transferred to the group has been wounded and inasmuch as a person is not pri proud in the narcissistic sense of his person but he has transferred all narcissism to the idol let us put it that way then indeed when this group or this idol's narcissism is attacked then he acts like a madman because then in reality his own individual personal narcissism is attacked and therefore if it were not true that the narcissistic group image is true then he is nothing again if you tell one racist in the south or in south africa that it's not true that the negroes are inferior then indeed for him this means that he is nobody because he lives only by the strength of the narcissistic belief that just being white is enough, or rather not enough. It is the most wonderful thing in the world, and everybody else is inferior. And then you get the extreme hostilities and destructiveness which follow from the wounding of this national, racial, religious, political narcissism. And that's why I, uh, the reason why I spoke of narcissism at such length in this course of lectures, because I think our great problem is that if you want to become human, then indeed we must try to overcome our narcissism, first to recognize it and then to overcome it. And if you want to understand a good deal of the hostility and destructiveness which exists between groups, we have to have some appreciation of the narcissistic phenomenon which is involved here. Now, before I uh, close, I should like to make one statement which is related to what I just said. If you try to understand what is the teaching of all great humanist religions and philosophy, by which I mean Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and humanist philosophy, uh, then I would say all their precepts and teaching can be summarized or can be uh, expressed if we use psychological terminology in one form, namely to say they all teach the task of human development is to overcome one's narcissism. That means in its most modest form 
to love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, that really means if you can love thy neighbor as much as you love yourself, you are, a, you are at least beyond the worst pathology of narcissism. You are at least as open to the world outside as you are to yourself. Then comes another formulation which you also find in the Old Testament, and that is to love the stranger. That is to say, to be able to see another human being as you see yourself, to forget about your membership in a group, in a family, in a nation, in a race, in a religion, because thy neighbor becomes, your neighbor becomes fully human, or you might say, you cease to be a stranger to yourself, and that's why the neighbor, uh, that's why the stranger ceases to be a stranger. The New Testament ex has expressed it in a still more radical form, which, however, in content is not essentially different, I believe, from the command to love thy neighbor, and that is love thy enemy. Because if you have lost all your narcissism, there is no enemy. There is only another human being whom you see objectively. Uh, I think all this religious and philosophical teaching of all humanistic religions while it did not develop explicitly the concept of narcissism, nevertheless amounts to the great insight that, let us say, nature has gifted, has given, has endowed us with a good deal of narcissism for biological survival. But if our aim is not only and exclusively biological survival, but if our aim is to be called, become fully human, then all spiritual laws tell us that our aim is to overcome all narcissism, to be able to be completely open to the world, and that means also to stop hating. It means to be fully alive. And in that sense, there is a great deal of connection between necrophilia and narcissism, and biophilia and the overcoming of narcissism, although they are not identical concepts. Uh, I believe to be aware of one's narcissism, of one's reactions one has to it, of the way one has transferred one's personal narcissism to certain groups and so-called causes, to be aware of the, of the anger and of the depression which may result in any wound to our narcissism, the insight that if we want to become fully human, then indeed our main task is to recognize and overcome our narcissism every moment. I think this theme is not only of theoretical importance, but it is also of great importance for individual growth, and I think specifically for that which all of us want and which we find so difficult to attain, and that is peace. Thank you. number of interesting questions and a lack of time. Uh, so I could not even read all of them, and I just uh, 
do the same I did in the previous lectures. What are the dynamics involved that would lead one to invest one's narcissism in a group rather than in oneself? Is it an awareness of one's own inadequacy? My answer would be yes. And in fact, I try to imply that or to say it explicitly in this lecture. The less reason you have to be proud of yourself realistically, the more will you react narcissistically to the simple to your simple person, to your person. I, I, I should like to uh, say something here, which I left out in my lecture because of lack of time. Uh, and that is, you find one might distinguish, both in individuals and in groups, uh, something like what one might call a benign and a malignant form of narcissism. By the benign form of narcissism, I mean that narcissism which has been directed toward work and achievement. That is to say, you want to glorify yourself by achieving something in reality. So you do this, that, and the other. You are a good carpenter, although that's rare these days, or you are um, uh, good at your job. You are good at bringing up your children, even. Uh, <clears throat> now, I call this narcissism benign, because if your narcissism is directed toward an achievement, the dialectics of this process already tend to, at the same time, also to make your narcissism more be benign and, in fact, to restrict it. Because once you really, your narcissism consists of, the object of your narcissism is to be a good carpenter or a good mother, then you must pay great attention to your material, whether it's wood or children, and therefore, if you pay all your attention to yourself, you will fail in your narcissistic aim. You find the same thing in nations, in groups. Inasmuch as a narcissism is directed towards something which can be achieved in reality, the narcissism loses its malignant quality. While as soon as your narcissism is pure and simple, the narcissism, me, that's wonderful. My nation, that's wonderful. I don't have to prove anything except that I have a white skin. Then your narcissism is malignant because then you don't even have to make an effort. And then you remain in the fiction of a narcissistic world in which the fiction of the superiority of your white skin is uh, a reality until one day maybe you wake up and find that two-thirds of the world find that white skin is not such a great thing. And then, of course, you are deeply threatened and want to destroy everybody who doesn't believe in the superiority of white skin. Uh, where can one find the Unamuno speech you quoted from last week? You can find it in a book by Thomas on the Spanish Civil War. Uh, I uh, don't know exactly the, uh, what the exact title is, whether it's just the Spanish Civil War or um, I think that's the title. The author is Tom Thomas and you find it in any of the better bookstores in town. Uh, it's a most interesting book, but in general, it's an excellent objective, more or less objective analysis of the Spanish Civil War, but uh, there you find Unamuno's speech. I'm uh, sure you cannot, you will find, I have seen the book in bookstores uh, uh, recently, so it's, uh, in fact, I saw it as a hard, um, as a paperback in double days in, uh, 57th Street and 5th Avenue or wherever, whatever street it is. There, there you have it in, in, uh, in paperback. Love your enemy. Could one love or should one love a Hitler? And how do you deal with a Hitler? Well, if you are a Christian and follow Christian precepts, you love Hitler. That is apparently very difficult. Indeed it is. Uh, but the answer is, from a Christian standpoint, yes. The answer is, from a Jewish standpoint, also yes. Let me tell you a Talmudic story, which I'm sure some of you know are familiar with the Jewish tradition. On the day of the Passover, when allegedly, or no, that was, is a story of, which refers to the reality, allegedly, the day when the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. Maybe I mentioned this story last time. I don't know, it could be because it's, I love the story very much. 
the angels sang the psalms of praise, of hallelujah to God, because as the Talmud assumes, they were of course on the side of the Hebrews. And uh, when God heard this song of praise and of jubilation, he said to the angels, how can you dare to sing a song of joy when my creatures have died? And the angels stopped. And until this day, in an Orthodox Jewish service, on that day of Passover, which is, according to tradition, the day of the drowning of the Egypts, only half of the song of joy, of the Psalms of joy, is recited, which are fully recited on any other holiday. That is another example from the Jewish tradition of love your enemy. Even your enemy is human, and you must not triumph when he is destroyed. Can narcissism ever be beneficial to mankind? Well, I think I have answered that in a way by my different distinguishing malignant and benign narcissism. Uh, would you discuss Descartes' skepticism as a form of narcissism and that of skepticism in general? What affect has narcissism, or what effect, I guess, on the sexual expression of people? Well, these are two rather separate questions. The second one is very complicated. The first one's complicated too, but I should like to say a word about it in answer, uh, which is a slightly roundabout way of answering the question. Uh, those who know Freud's writings well will remember that Freud once said that the narcissism of the modern world was deeply hurt by the discoveries of Copernicus, of Darwin, and of his own. Because these discoveries wounded man's narcissism, that he is the center of the universe, uh, that he is a special creation which has nothing to do with the rest of nature, and eventually that his conscious thought is all there is, and that by his conscious thought he really controls his fate. Or that his conscious thought, let us put it better, uh, uh, expresses or represents reality. Well, I think that scientific skepticism and the new mode of scientific thought which comes up in the Renaissance was indeed, as Freud said, a blow to man's narcissism. It was not only Copernicus. It was all scientific thinking which forces us to be confronted with the fact that many of our thoughts are either incorrect, not real, or share wish-fulfilling wish thinking. So in this sense, I believe that modern scientific thought is indeed, as Freud said, a blow to narcissism. But if we analyze the reaction of modern man to this blow of narcissism, I'm afraid we get a peculiar split in the reaction. We find one reaction which has really and fruitfully accepted this blow to narcissism and has developed an increased attitude against narcissism, and I think this attitude is expressed in the great humanists of our day, which often are the greatest scientists, especially many of the great physicists, biologists, the natural sciences, scientists, have, I think, taken a development in which narcissism has been overcome by the very fact that they have learned to respect facts as against wishful thinking. But the majority of men seems to have reacted to this wounding of their narcissism by just changing the object of narcissism. One is the development of nationalism, which is a relatively modern phenomenon, and the narcissism invested in modern technique. What are people proud of today is to be of a certain race or nation, but they are equally proud of the gadgets of the achievements of technique, which is something quite different from scientific thought. It's a result of it, but it's something quite different. And that's why the travel to the moon becomes today one of the most exciting things, and people feel narcissistically involved in the question, who will send the first space, the first man to the moon, as if that mattered, as if it made any particular sense to go to the moon anyway, when this planet is still to be developed fully and in great danger. Uh, in other words, I would say that modern science and modern skepticism, rational skepticism, 
was one way of overcoming narcissism, but at the same time, the wound to narcissism created by modern science has, men, has led men to invest narcissism in the products of modern science, and that is modern gadgetry and technique. Um, easy expression, I love you as mu so much I could eat you up, as said by a mother to her baby, not a, nat uh, not a natural one, but necrophilic. Well, it may be natural, but uh, in as much as it is natural, or it may be innocent, let us say, but I'm sure it's not necrophilic, but cannibalistic. <laughs> uh, that is to say, the necrophilic person wants to to be in relation to the dead. The cannibalist wants to eat the living thing. Uh, but of course, uh, it is uh, only a small symptom, and uh, you have to take <laughs> the whole picture. And I don't want anybody to feel to be diagnosed as a cannibalist for having ever said this. But he, he or she, in this case, should watch her step. <laughs> Uh, the next question says, would you please elaborate on the difference between narcissism and the creative self-love you speak of in your books? Well, I think it's an entirely different phenomenon. Love is, as I have tried to explain in the books, uh, the uh, question refers it to, is a feeling of affirmation, of care, of responsibility for the life of another person or myself. Uh, narcissism, for myself or the group, is the blind... In German, they call it Affenliebe, monkey's love. That is to say, the blind uh, admiration for oneself, which in itself is not life, but it is just a feeling of an inflated self-image. Uh, any narcissistic mother who, who thinks her child is the most wonderful being just because uh, Johnny or whatever the name is, is her child's, this will not contribute to the child's development. Uh, it will create a fictitious feeling of wonderfulness, which is of a narcissistic nature. It has nothing to do with love whatsoever. Um, well, this is difficult for me to read, uh, the handwriting. Can you talk about reverse narcissism, where one makes or transforms the other person into oneself and sacrifices oneself, that is, by feeding the other person, uh, feeding oneself? Yes, indeed, and I tried to, to uh, speak about that when I talked about, uh, in this lecture today, about making something an idol and then feeding the idol, I have the greatness of my idol. Uh, this is what the prophets call idolatry. Um, how does one know if one's political ideological beliefs are rooted in narcissism or objective social and political realities? Well, that is relatively simple. There are two ways of knowing that. First, you look at the person who voices a political ideology. It isn't so much what he says, but how he says it. Either the lack or the presence of fanaticism, of hate of uh, narcissistic inflation, which strikes you when you look at the person as a person, uttering certain words. But secondly, of course, there is very good rational judgment for that. You just don't look only at his mouth, but you do indeed look at his argument, and you, you try to criticize from a rational scientific standpoint, from the standpoint of reason, uh, what the validity of his argument is. And you might then see that there are certain flaws in his argument, which you then might explain as being produced by his narcissism. Uh, there is no reason whatsoever to suspect every conviction as being narcissistic. What one is required is a certain sensitivity to the narcissistic aura of a person, and furthermore, a certain to take the trouble of rational analysis of an argument, rather than to take the easy path to either assume every argument is to be taken at face value, or on the other hand, to take a relativistic position that every conviction is nothing but a narcissistic ideology. 
Well, to be alive means to take some trouble. And uh, it takes some trouble to make this, to distinguish between a conviction which is not narcissistic. And it's not so difficult if you really take the trouble. Uh, if you really watch the nature of the argument and of the one who offers the argument. Uh, well, I guess really I should stop here and take this as the last question. Please clarify your statement, and I paraphrase, that oversensitivity, in parentheses, deep perception, is not quite normal. I didn't mean that, and I'm glad the question is raised. I said, if I uh, remember correctly, this in the context of trying to describe the particular sensitivity which you find <coughs> in a highly narcissistic person, namely a psychotic person. And I tried to say, and I knew this was a very difficult concept to develop in a short time, that this person has so much, uh, let us say, burned the bridges between himself and reality, that then this person may be freer to be perceptive to the world outside to another person, precisely because he doesn't, in another sense, care, because there is no bridge which connects him. Now, this is a terribly difficult phenomenon, and I uh, could not, uh, I would not have the time to explain it, but I should like to say that also I wouldn't be able to explain it because it's still a very mysterious phenomenon. I'm always delighted when I have the rare chance to talk to a physicist or natural scientist because they unashamedly say that the more they know, the less they know. That things get more and more mysterious the further you get in the field of theoretical physics or any one of the fundamental natural sciences. I'm afraid psychology is still very old-fashioned in this sense and kind of positivistic. And many psychologists and many who are interested in psychology expect that uh, the more we know, the more we know, but we don't. Uh, one really has to expect that this field is full of riddles, full of things which you can't explain. And in fact, I want to apologize for giving a lecture, three lectures, which may sound to some of you as if I thought things were relatively simple, one has only to express them. This is merely a didactic trick. Since you come here for a lecture, I uh, uh, have to try to explain things in such a way which would seem to, which would make it appear as if they are simple. But they are not simple at all. It's just a way of presenting things. And I want to conclude by saying this very explicitly, that while one might try to express things in a relatively simple way, that our knowledge of man is much less than our knowledge of the atom, of the cell, and that most of what we are confronted in the field, in this field, are puzzles and lack of knowledge and problems, but that we are in the same position which every scientist is, and that is that the more questions there are, the more interesting a thing is. And I would say, for those who are interested in the problem of human nature, if you want certainty, then indeed you shouldn't be interested. Then there are other fields which give certainty. But if you like the adventure of feeling you know nothing, and the more you know, the less you know, then indeed this is, is one of the good fields to be interested in. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 